There was once a little man called Niggle who had a long journey to make. He did not want to go. Indeed, the whole idea was distasteful to him, but he could not get out of it. He knew he would have to start sometime, but he did not hurry with his preparations. Niggle was a painter, not a very successful one, partly because he had many other things to do. Struck by the simple beauty of a leaf, Niggle decided to paint one. He began with simple strokes, but soon began to fuss over every little detail. As time went on, he found it necessary to add more and more context to this painting, until his canvas became massive, and his leaf became a tree in a countryside, with a far landscape stretching behind. Yet Nigel couldn't ever seem to finish his painting or even his leaf. He got so caught up in the tiny details, insisting on getting it just right, and he also got caught up in helping his neighbors, for he had a kind, if not grumbling, heart. And always nagging at the back of his mind was this approaching journey. One day the journey befell him unexpectedly, and he had to leave his painting unfinished and niggled over. As he arrived at the far country, he found a remarkable sight. It was his tree. The full idea of the tree that he had had in his mind was here, in reality, full of more beauty than he had ever imagined. When J.R.R. Tolkien wrote a short story called Leaf by Niggle, he invited us to identify with Niggle, this fussy little painter who never got to finish his work before death, which was his great journey. But Tolkien demonstrates the eternal value of our work and invites us right into the middle of this little story. Ursula Le Guin, a prolific and profound writer of science fiction, once said that the story, from Rumpelstiltskin to War and Peace, is one of the basic tools invented by the human mind for the purpose of understanding. There have been great societies that did not use the wheel, but there have been no societies that did not tell stories. There is something about storytelling that fundamentally connects with our humanity. Stories give us perspective. They help us practice empathy. They give us a context for our pain, our desires, our hopes, and our passions. The most profound book of all time starts, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Our entire faith is rooted in a storytelling tradition. God told the first story as he spoke creation into existence. He recruited the biblical authors to tell his story throughout the centuries and even sent his word incarnate. Stories seriously matter. They are the best didactic tool in the world and the best monomic device. If you want to teach something, don't give them a list of facts. Tell them a story. Rudyard Kipling famously said, if history were taught in the form of stories, it would never be forgotten. Well, as communicators in the church, we have an important message to get across. So why are we using salesy lingo and bullet point jibber jabber to try and educate our communities? Why not use stories? Thanks for joining us. This is the MyCom Podcast, where we explore the intersection of marketing, technology, and the church. In this episode, we're going to take a look at this ancient tradition and see how storytelling could impact how we talk about our churches in a meaningful way. I'm John Watson, and this is our marketing raconteur, Darby Jones. Hi there. So let me clear the air for a minute. I'm not saying that you should put up a banner on your church that says once upon a time. Telling a literal story in marketing can work, but it's got to be carefully and sparingly done. Let's take a look at an example of what we're talking about. You've probably heard of Tom's shoes, right? They're those cloth shoes with no discernible shape that everyone under the age of 35 seems to be wearing. My wife tells me they're incredibly comfortable, and I will take her word for it. Well, Tom's embarked on a really effective and really meaningful marketing campaign called One Day Without Shoes. If you go to toms.co.uk slash one day without shoes, you'll see what I mean. Right on the front page... They're telling a story visually with a wonderful picture of children running in the Tom's shoes and the word thank you written over the picture in a dozen or more languages. Then the text over the image reads, 27,435 new shoes to children in 10 countries on May 10th, 2016. So the One Day Without Shoes campaign was about Tom's donating a pair of shoes for every pair bought during a time period. It was hashtagged, it was viral, and it was meaningful. So here's their story. This company loves great shoes. They want you to have great shoes, and they want you to help needy kids around the world have great shoes too. That's the kind of story I can easily see myself in. 
there is really no barrier to me identifying with it. I like great shoes. Who prefers mediocre shoes? And of course, I want to help kids who need them get shoes on their feet too. That, that's the point of storytelling and marketing, to make an emotional connection with your reader so that they can see themselves in your story. Now, just to make a little sidebar, your brand or your church is not the hero of the story. From a marketing perspective, the hero is the reader. It's your audience. Tom's did that really well. It's all about how I can help kids get the shoes they need. Anyway, Tom's then took it to the next level. They added some more details to their story, and it got really effective. Further down that page on the website, they they shined a spotlight on India. The copy points out that Tom's Shoes helps students complete their school uniforms, which actually increases their likelihood of regular attendance. That's awesome. When I participate in this campaign now, I feel like I'm not just clothing someone. I'm actually helping them get an education. That's pretty remarkable for a shoe company. So that's a good story. Now let's look at one more example. This is one of my favorite brands that I use every single day. It's Moleskine. And yeah, I'm pretty sure it's pronounced Moleskine, not Moleskine or Moleskine. But you can Google it if you don't believe me. If you don't know who Moleskine is, first of all, shame on you. Moleskine makes notebooks, most notably, no pun intended. But let me read you a little bit from their website. This is closer to being a literal story, but it sets the tone for their whole brand really well. So here it is. It all started many years ago with a pocket-sized black object, the product of a great tradition. The Moleskine Notebook is, in fact, the heir and successor to the legendary notebook used by artists and thinkers over the past two centuries. Among them, Vincent van Gogh, Pablo Picasso, Ernest Hemingway, and Bruce Chatwin. A simple black rectangle with rounded corners, an elastic page holder, and an eternal expandable pocket, a nameless object with a spare perfection all its own, produced for over a century by a small French bookbinder that supplied the stationery shops of Paris where the artistic and literary avant-gardes of the world browsed and bought them. A trusted and handy travel companion, the notebook held invaluable sketches, notes, stories, and ideas that would one day become famous paintings or the pages of a beloved book. Today, the Moleskine brand is synonymous with culture, travel, memory, imagination, and personal identity in both the real world and the digital world. Moleskine objects are partners for the creative and imaginative professions of our time. They represent around the world a symbol of contemporary nomadism. No, I'm not getting paid to read this, by the way. I just really like this brand, and I think they did a good job. I call it like I see it. But let me tell you, every morning when I get up early, I grab my Zebra F301 pen, best pen, and my Moleskin journal. And I basically, I want to be Hemingway. I want to be a part of this tradition that they describe. They've set up these these mythical heroes of art and literature and told me a story through which I could connect with their muse through a simple but elegant black journal. The writing on their site is a bit on the nose, but it's really fun and almost has an air of of like laughing at its own snobbery, which I enjoy. It's really just spot on for their brand. And yeah, any notebook will do, but I still go out and spend 20 bucks every once in a while on a new moleskin. I've got that brand loyalty. So this copy from Moleskine, it's meant to invite you in and compel you to some designated action. In this case, buying a notebook. Right. That that reminds me of a Michael article we published a while back. It's called How to Move People to Give or Take Action. And it was based on a Forbes magazine article called What Levers Would Move People to Action. And the article cites commercials that leave you wondering, what did that have to do with the actual product? I mean, the commercial was funny, but it didn't really move me to buy or do anything. So the article goes on to say, we shouldn't spend so much time trying to amuse or even inspire people. That doesn't move them to action. What really motivates people to act is getting them to feel something. If you can get people to feel empathy, joy, trust, fear, sadness, anger, whatever, longing, longing, then, Mm -hmm. then it's more likely they'll support your cause. And that's what stories do. That's the bridge to their feelings. They pull at your heartstrings. So, You should study the art of storytelling. Invite 
your best storytellers and your congregation to share short stories and anecdotes to promote your campaigns and mission efforts or big events. MyCom published an article called Use the Art of Storytelling to Resonate that you should check out. It's in the podcast description. We'll put that article as well as how to move people to give or take action. It's, it's really good stuff. And I just want to point out, it's, it's not like you're tricking or manipulating people by right. using basic psychology. As long as your stories are true and you have integrity, understanding human nature is just a tool you can use. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, there's nothing manipulative about a good story. It is the oldest tradition that we have. And I think that the main purpose of a story is to stir up something in us. I mean, that's kind of the concept of a muse. It's an external influence on your emotions and your creative thought and your will. Right. And so stories kind of act in that capacity. So, yeah, whether it's, you know, using short stories or anecdotes to illustrate a point to help people connect with your mission, or whether it's using kind of a marketing approach to storytelling in the way that you talk about your brand or about your church organization, storytelling can be really effective. I mean, you, so you don't make notebooks or shoes, right? You're not Tom's, you're not Moleskine. So how does this land on a church? Well, here are a couple quick examples of how some UMC churches have used marketing storytelling concepts in their main website copy to engage the reader in something pretty meaningful. First United Methodist Church in Portland, Oregon, includes this on their homepage. As a creation care congregation, we advocate for lifestyles and social policies which bring healing and renewal to our precious earth. That's some well-written copy, and they've told us one of their unique emphases and invited us in as co-inhabitors of our planet from a uniquely Christian perspective. Here's another one from the United Methodist Church of the Resurrection in Kansas City. They have a large banner on their homepage that says, Welcome Home. Below that it reads, Hope, Meaning, Purpose. Be a part of something bigger than yourself. It doesn't end there. Their main navigation items could have been something like worship, connect, visit, etc. But instead, the three main nav buttons below the main header read, Worship with us, find community, and make an impact. Do you see how they've told a story and invited you into it? They're saying something bigger than us is happening here, and you're you're welcome to be a part of it. This is a place of hope where you can really connect with people and really make an impact on your community and on the world. That's pretty good church storytelling, and that's just an example of how you can apply the concept even to just a banner on your homepage, but it can make a real difference. That reminds me of a study done in 2015 by Barna. Mm. Uh, they did it on behalf of the UMC, and they found that 74% of all seekers surveyed found the tagline, open hearts, open minds, open doors, much more appealing than any of our other taglines, like putting beliefs into action, church can happen anywhere, or rethink church. Right. So this is really important. Uh, It's an important message today, especially because people want to be accepted for who they are. They want to meet new friends and role models to lean on when times get tough, to connect with on a deeper level, to provide accountability in their lives. So you may want to not only use the Open Hearts tagline for your church, but to also think about how that message can be incorporated into your church's story, how it can be incorporated into your services, ministries, and worship. Yeah, absolutely. And for all of you United Methodist listeners out there, uh, we've kind of done the hard work here in a sense, right? That tagline, the Open Hearts tagline, was really carefully developed to address the pain points or kind of... um, plot conflict, if you will, to use storytelling language, in the audience's experience. We're speaking to their reality and inviting them into a story that they can actually relate to and actually want to relate to. Do you know what I mean? I mean, if we tell a story of of a mundane church experience that's just like every other, they can relate to it. They've been to churches like that, but they don't care. They don't want to relate to it. But the seeker, as the UMC has defined that broad audience, they're looking for a place where 
they are truly welcomed from the heart, where their perspectives will be considered and valued, you know, where the doors are flung open for them. There's not a careful screening process to who gets in and out. You know, these are things that say something really profound about the United Methodist Church, and they speak to some of the longings of our hearts. So definitely, I mean, take that tagline, use that tagline, build off of that tagline, write other copy coming from those concepts, you know. It's worthwhile, and we've already done the research to go into that for you. So that's a really great tool you can build from. So I know that taking storytelling as a concept and letting it land on marketing and church marketing, nonetheless, can be a little bit nebulous, right? It took me a while to wrap my head around it, and I, you know, I still am learning it and pressing into it. And it took me even longer to figure out how to apply those concepts to what I'm actually doing in the marketing world. But here's a three-step exercise that you can do pretty quickly to help identify your church's brand story. And then from there, you can use that to kind of explore visual storytelling and explore how to write a good blog post from this and do a podcast and all these different things. So here we go. The three-step exercise is this. First, write down why you exist. Why did your church begin? And why does that matter today? That's a really important piece of your story. Second, write down what makes your church unique. What are your emphases? It can be social justice, loving neighbors in your local community, overseas mission work, you know, a particular aspect of theology. It can be any of these things, but every church has their own emphases that set them apart from the other churches. And then third, identify and write down some of those pain points that your first two steps might actually address. This is the conflict in your story's plot. This is where you should see the needs and problems of your audience and start to think through how your message and your church can address those in a really meaningful way. Now, hang on to that document, that piece of paper. Hopefully it's in a moleskin. We're going to use this part in the part two episode of this mini-series on storytelling and church marketing. And by the way, what you're outlining there uh, that this process is basically the beginning of a church marketing plan Mm -hmm. you know finding your church's unique calling uh, figuring out what your community needs and how to effectively meet those needs is the very first part of a marketing plan and we have an excellent church marketing tool. It's currently being optimized right now. It's, it's a bit lengthy right now and kind of an arduous process that we are trying to simplify down to just a couple week process that a few people can do rather than a whole marketing plan. And yeah. so hopefully by the time this podcast airs, uh, the more streamlined version will be ready. But we will put the links to the online course teaching you how to build a market plan, church marketing plan in the description below. And the new church marketing tool on umcom.org was pretty much based on that online course anyways. So check that out and try to figure out your church's unique calling. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's really great content. Even as it stands today, it's so worth reading and going through the videos. And, you know, ultimately, guys, what we're doing is there's this, you know, object in front of us that is church marketing. And it's hard to wrap our minds around what it should look like and what it can look like. So we're trying to stare at it from every angle, you know. And sometimes we're going to talk about some really practical, you know, here's how to do an advertising campaign on Facebook. And sometimes we're going to take a step back, look at a different facet of that object and say, what if we came at it from storytelling? What does that mean, you know? So we're trying to educate ourselves in the concept of church marketing. It's just fairly unexplored territory. And it's kind of unfamiliar. That's why you get reactions to that term. But we're trying to take that fear away and invite you into that story. We think it really matters. So thanks for joining us. This is the the MyCom podcast. And if you haven't subscribed to the MyCom newsletter, you definitely should go do that. Every couple weeks, we'll send you a few really profound articles that touch on these same subjects. And it's just, it's been a great thing that's been going for about seven years now. And it is well worth your time. If you found this helpful, we would love it if you'd give us a quick rating on iTunes, share it with others who would benefit. And as always, we really want to hear from you. So if you've got a comment, a suggestion, or a story to share, email us, podcast at umcom.org. See you next time.